Hi everybody, this is Dr. R.P. from the Department of Oral and Cellophation Surgery to Biology Medical College and Hospital. Let's see about salivary gland pathologies in this lecture. First of all, what are salivary glands? Salivary glands are exocrine glands, which is positioned in the head and in and around the oral cavity. They secrete their salivary contents into the mouth. Their function is to help and keep the oral mucosa protected and lubricated, which also help in the initial stages of digestion during mastication of food, so that the food bolus is granted and ready to be swallowed for further processing. They contribute to digestion through the enzymes they secrete with saliva, mainly amylase, that starts the digestion of carbohydrates. The glands vary widely in their size, but also they are classified based on the nature of the saliva they excrete. Let's see, what are the types of glands? The salivary glands are classified mainly as major and minor salivary glands. Major salivary glands are parotid glands, sublingual and submandibular salivary glands. And there are hundreds and hundreds of minor salivary glands located in the oral cavity. According to the types of cell, it is classified as serous, mucus, and mixed salivary gland, which is nothing but serum mucus, which contains both serous and mucus cells. Parotid gland is serous salivary gland, and sublingual and minor salivary glands are mucus. Submandibular gland is the mixed salivary gland. Let's see about parotid gland briefly. Parotid gland is located between the ramus of the mandible and external middle muscle. And their excretory duct is named as tensin duct, which opens on the buccal wall at the level of maxillary second member. And submandibular gland, which is located beneath the tongue, a their excretory duct is called as Wharton's duct, which opens at sublingual papilla under the tongue and the sublingual gland which is located beneath the sublingual fold and their excretory duct they are they have multiple excretory ducts which are or which opens along the sublingual folds and minor salivary glands are located in buccal region labial region lingual mucosa soft palate as well as soft palate um, coming to salivary gland pathology, let's see how it's classified. They are classified as developmental disorders, functional disorders, obstructive disorders, cyst of salivary glands, cyst which occur in salivary gland, asymptomatic enrichment of salivary gland, infection, which is either a viral or bacterial in origin, and finally autoimmune disorders of salivary gland. Let's see developmental disorders. First of all, ectopic salivary glands. Ectopic salivary glands are nothing, but the salivary gland tissue, when the salivary gland tissue develops at the site where it is where it is not normally formed or said to be ectopic. Let's see the clinical features, which is usually occur in the cervical region near the parotid gland, and especially in the body of the mandible, posterior to the posterior. And uh, they also have communication with the major salivary glands. Ectopic salivary glands occur occurring in the gingiva is described as gingival salivary gland chorus stomach. And then it's all about staphylosis, which is nothing but the developmental inclusion of the glandular tissue within or more prominently adjacent to the lingual surface of the mandible in a deep, well circumscribed dip this, uh, depression, which is described by Stapney in 1932. And because of that, this depression, this developmental inclusion of glandular tissue is defined as Stapney cyst, which is pseudo cyst uh, and have no epithelial level. And let's see the clinical significance. Where this is a site for the development of a retention cyst or even neoplasm or even neoplasm, aplasia or hypoplasia. 
Aplasia is congenitally absence of salivary gland. Hypoplasia is high, uh, hypofunction of salivary gland is termed as hypoplasia. Aplasia is visually occurs. Visually occurs in combination with congenital anomalies, usually uh, with Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome. And let's see what are the clinical features are. When one or groups of salivary glands mixing urinatally or bilaterally termed as hypoplasia, which causes the restoria genital glands, and then leads to yearly loss of teeth, dry and smooth oral mucosa, cracking and fissuring are evident at the corner of the mouth. Uh, how to manage um, aplasia and hypoplasia? By maintaining good oral hygiene, one should maintain aplasia and hypoplasia. Let's see hyperplasia, hyperfunctioning of uh, salivary gland. It, it may cause due to hormonal or metabolic changes in our body. Let's see what are the clinical features. It is usually asymptomatic, which are warm, sessile, and normal in appearance. It usually occurs in minor salivary glands of palate. How do you manage hyperplasia? By simple excision or microscopic examination. And then most common developmental anomaly of salivary gland or accessory ducts, which is uh, commonly seen in superior and anterior to normal sensing duct or face. Atresia. What is called atresia? It is congenital occlusion or absence of salivary gland ducts, which is commonly located in submandibular duct in the head of the nose, which causes severe xerostomia. The xerostomia is defined as dryness of mouth um, due to decreased salivary secretion and diverticulate. Diverticulate are nothing but small pouches from outputted in the ductal system of one of the major salivary glands, which also leads, leads to recurrent episodes of acute paratitis. And then, let's see, congenital fistula. Congenital fistula is a sinus tract form, which is found either in crease, behind the pinna, or in front of the uh, tragus, in the external origin nervous. And what are the clinical features? It is usually uh, seen in patients with brachial gut. It is unilateral or bilateral, but bilateral condition is rare. Its secondary infection leads to abscess formation. So, complete surgical excision of the sinus tract along with the complete uh, full resection of facial nerve is uh, needed to prevent secondary infection of uh, congenital fistula. Let's see the functional disorders. Salivaria, which is also known as tyrosin, is nothing but increased salivary secretion due to stimulation of parasympathetic system, called, which causes profuse secretion of water saliva. Then let's see the etiology. Cyanox, they are drugs which have ability to stimulate salivation. What are cyanox? Or the drugs which have ability to stimulate salivation, um, lithium and polymeric agonist are uh, basically act as a cyanide. The local factors which lead leads to cyanidia uh, condition or such as dermatitis, anic, it is nothing but acute necrotic and ulcerated gingivitis, erythema multifoli, may lead to cyanidia. Systematic cases also influences cyanidia. Um, systemic diseases such as paralysis, Down syndrome, Parkinson's syndrome, and chronic neuritis, and undetermined neuromuscular disorders may also lead to this condition. And then, protective buffering system. What is called as protective buffering system? It is nothing but the episodic hypersecretion of saliva or water drugs, which acts to improvise stomach acid in individual with gastroesophageal reflux disease. By this reflex action also may uh, lead to cyanosia. A psychic factor, metal poisoning and facial paralysis also lead to uh, cyanosia condition. And what are the clinical features? The main clinical uh, feature is a drooling, which causes cheek scarring, lip chapping or infection to constant exposure to saliva 
and this may also lead to a social rejection. Then, uh, let's see what are the non surgical management of uh, uh, treating salaria patients. There's no treatment is recommended for children below two years of age. Then, we have to uh, give oral motor honey and biofeedback. Biofeedback is uh, to uh, train the patients to swallow simultaneously, which also helps in uh, sialuric uh, condition. And uh, another one, non surgical management is the removal of local factors, such as uh, we have to remove the dental disease uh, and nasal airway obstruction. We have to clear the nasal airway obstruction over seating of uh, dental appliances and inappropriate medications are stopped. Then drugs. Um, atropine sulfate plays major role in non surgical management of salaria, which can reduce the amount of wasting secretion, intraoral accumulation, and pharyngeal and laryngeal pooling of saliva. Let's see the dosage. For adults, we usually give 0.4 mg for every 4 to 6 hours. And for children, dosage varies as varies from 0.01 mg per kilogram of body weight. Uh, atropine sulfate is mainly contraindicated in patients with asthma, glaucoma, or sinusia, which is found usually between the iris and lens of the eye. What are other drugs used to manage a sinusia are scopolamine, methantolin, and propantolin. Let's see the surgical management of sinusia, which is usually recommended in patients with cognitive delay. And in patients who fail the non surgical therapy for minimum of six months. Um, what are the uh, primary surgical management? Let's see. Relocation of duct to tonsillar portion will reduce salivary flow and relief by 2%. And bilateral tympanic neurectomy. What is bilateral tympanic neurectomy? Is section of cauda tympanic which destroy parasympathetic innervation to the glands, uh, which in turn decreases uh, salivary flow, salivary secretion. Then, uh, xerostomia. Xerostomia is nothing but decreased salivary secretion. Whereas xylaria is increased salivary secretion, xerostomia is um, exact opposite uh, to the condition of xylaria. Uh, here, the salivary secretion is decreased. What is etiology? The main ideology is radiation induced and uh, pharmacologically induced xerostomia, uh, mainly due to the drugs uh, uh, which uh, that are called atropin uh, uh, sulfate, which are used in the treatment of xylaria, may lead to xerostomic condition in Britain. Local factors such as decreased mastication, smoking, and mouth treating may lead to xerostomic condition. Development of abnormalities in salivary glands, tumors, autoimmune states, and diseases with affect, uh, which affect the apparent or apparent portion of neural transmission reflex may also lead to serotonin condition. And the patient with systemic complex, uh, complications such as nutritional deficiency, fluid loss, diabetic meningitis, and in patients with Jogren syndrome, HIV infection, sarcoidosis, and patients who have a graft in their body shows um, xerostomia. And what are the clinical features of um, xerostomia? Usually the patient with painful salivary gland enlargement due to dryness, and uh, uh, the patient has increased thirst, and they have difficulty in swallowing speech and eating dry food. And frequent dental infections are appreciated in patients with xerostomia. And the patients are intolerant, creating intolerance towards uh, dental appliances uh, due to the lack of lubrication. And sanitizers is the main problem. This is also due to uh, the lubrica uh, lubrication uh, factor of saliva. And also, saliva contains many antimicrobials. Uh, candidiasis usually occur or pseudomembranous and hyperplastic. Here, the saliva becomes foamy, thick, and goopy saliva. 
and let's see the management of uh, uh, xyloria ah uh, no the management of xerostomia where which is by and let's see how uh, we manage uh, the xerostomic condition by local stimulation uh, by doing gums, limbs, anastin, and septic acid, which contains lozenges and fringes, and the systemic uh, stimulation by bromohexin, which is nothing but the mucolytic and mucokinetic agent. Um, usually, they give uh, eight uh, milligram TDS for adult um, children below uh, five years, uh, four milligram. Uh, uh, Price rate and children between 5 to 10 years are usually prescribed uh, 4 mg TDS, anitol, prithium, and pyrocotton. So, uh, short duration of increased salary flow. Let's see the symptomatic treatment of the uh, restaurant. Salivary substance such as corfoxy methyl cellulose, hydroxy ethyl cellulose, artificial sweetness, chloride or chloride salts increase the salivary secretion, uh, which are discuss than the saliva and which is usually expensive. So these are the disadvantage of salivary substance. And another one and treatment is oral hygiene product such as lactoperoxidase, lysozyme, and lactoferrin, which increases salivary uh, secretion. And artificial saliva is the main um, treatment in uh, the rest of these patients. Artificial saliva, what, what's in, in the artificial saliva? Artificial saliva contains carboxymethyl cellulose, sorbitol, potassium chloride, sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride and type potassium nitrogen phosphate. Obstructive disorders of salivary gland, silopithiasis, which is nothing but salivary gland stone or salivary gland gaps. Formation of calcific concretions within the parenchyma or ductal system of the major and minor salivary gland is the salivary gland gaps. Calculus, which is formed usually by the crystalline structure, hydroxy appetite or water calcium phosphate. What are the chemical composition of calculus, which is which, which usually contains calcium phosphate, carbon traces of magnesium, potassium, chlorate, and ammonium? And this is, uh, you appreciate uh, the big salivary the calculus in, uh, in the uh, floor of the oral cavity. See, this is a big salivary from calculus. Here, in this OPG, we appreciate salivary gland calculus in, in the inferior board of the mandible. Here, this is salivary. Let's see what are the signs and symptoms of salivary. Patient has pain, which is intermittent, not continuous, and may suddenly get worse before new times and then slowly get better, which is due to partial obstruction of the duct. Swelling of the gland, which is also intermittent and often suddenly appearing or increasing before new times. This is a main clinical features and signs of um, to identify. Salivary gland calculus, which also leads to partial obstruction of uh, partial obstruction in the back. And tenderness of the involved gland. When we palpate, uh, the tenderness of the gland is evident. Palpable hot lump. If the stone is located near the, at the end of the duct, we can feel the hard uh, palpable lump. If the stone is near the submandibular duct or even the lap may be felt under the duct. So, uh, by this uh, method, we can 
and identify whether the duct is located um, in the duct or inside the gland. Lack of saliva can be from the duct, which is called as total obstruction of uh, gland. And erythema of the chlorophyll due, um, due to the obstruction in the flow of saliva, that's, um, that leads to uh, erythema or redness of the chlorophyll due to irritation, due to the lack of lubrication. And pus discharging from the duct, which is due to secondary infection um, due to um, salivary gland overflow. Surgical impediments and which also leads to bad breath. What are the current treatment options of um, treating um, salivary gland droplets for hydration or moist heat therapy? This is used to relieve pain. And NSAIDs also uh, use milk occasionally and having the patient. Uh, take any food or beverage that is bitter or sour. If patient take bitter or sour food, uh, any sites are usually prescribed. Sucking on citrus fruits such as lemon or oranges may increase salivation and promote spontaneous expulsion of the stone. Uh, if uh, in the case of small stones, uh, we use this technique to remove the uh, stone from the duct. Shock milk therapy, which is nothing but expo corporal shock lithotripsy, which uh, breaks the calculus into fine segments and uh, the stone got out from the doctor. Another um, minimally invasive uh, technique um, in the treatment of uh, Salivary gland calculus is salivary endoscopy. Let, uh, let me define the procedure. Um, we have to pre-operate, uh, pre-operatively assess the salivary duct opening, uh, which is usually done by the radio, radiological procedures. Once the dilution or incision of the duct opening is done, salivary endoscope is placed. Then saline can be used to dilate the ductal opening. After silo endoscope is inserted into the ductal opening, internal and internally of the duct is closely monitored. Silo removal. What after the silo endoscope uh, insertion? Once we enter uh, the silo endoscope within the duct, we can use a grasping technique to remove silo bit from the duct. In this technique, grasp with the deep prongs is used to hold the calculus from within and, 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 it, and it, uh, after holding the calculus, uh, we usually remove the calculus from within. And then small wire duct retrieval is done. Here, um, in spite of prongs, we, can, we use a small wire basket to retrieve the calculus, okay? uh, which is also usually used from within the calculus. And another uh, one important uh, treatment is mechanical fragmentation. We usually chop up uh, the calculus by using intracorporeal lithotripter and uh, we remove the fragments by, uh, by using uh, the grasper or uh, by basket retrieval system. And then another one important uh, thing is laser fragmentation. Um, these are the emerging uh, protocol for the treatment of cyanobacter. These are uh, the scrolls, uh, score, uh, which is used uh, to identify the salivary gland uh, stones by using salivary endoscope. L0, score L0 is given when the duct is free of stones, and L1 is given when there is floating stone. L2 is fixed when there is fixed stone, which is totally visible and inferior to the L1. And it also given to the fixed tool, which is totally visible, which is superior than a one. And L3 fixed tool, which is partially visible, which is whether it is portable or non-portable, it will include in um, L3. It will include this L3. Then produce and stenosis, which is very rare condition occurring in the uh, salivary gland. 
what is the ideology behind all this, which is usually occurring due to irritation from prosthetic complexes or many position to take, or from acute trauma, uh, usually by uh, the fish bone or a uh, sharp gas splinter from the wood, and intraductal tumor formation. If a uh, tumor present in the uh, duct, it will lead to pictures or stenosis, that is, occlusion of the duct, occlusion of the valvular term duct. Uh, what is the types of structures or stenosis? Uh, first one is papillary obstruction, uh, which, uh, which what are the types of the papillary obstruction? In papillary obstruction, there is acute ulcerative obstruction and chronic fibrotic stenosis. In acute ulcerative uh, obstruction is caused due to acute trauma to the papilla, which is usually treated by saline rinses and by giving salivary gland massage. In chronic fibrotic stenosis, uh, um, which is a recurrent and scarring may also occur. And another one is ductal obstruction. In, um, in papillary obstruction, uh, we have acute and chronic. In ductal obstruction, uh, it may, it may uh, occur secondary to acute trauma and secondary to irritation or scar contraction. If it occurs secondary to acute trauma, treatment is to provide ductal patency until the edema is resolved. Uh, if it is it occurs secondary to irritation or scar contracture, cyanograms are used to assess the status of the gland. Whether it is healthy or not, we can assess only by using cyanograms as a diagnostic aid. Dilation of duct involved will reduce the signs and symptoms. Um, if the gland is healthy, uh, we can use this uh, procedure. Uh, that is dilation of duct. If it is not improved, then ductal clamping is included, which is a removal of duct. So, treatment of sutures and infection. For such procedure, yeah, uh, we for previously discussed as previously discussed dilation. Dilation is employed. Uh, here, two types of balloons are commonly used, namely Bogarty 3 F4 and Lattisac F4. First step is to anesthetizing the duct using local uh, anesthesia by using two percolated needle After which, a dilator is ins inserted. Dilator is here. Dilator used here is uh, balloons. This dilator can be inflated up to three mm inside the duct. This inflation of dilator creates a pressure inside the duct, which helps in dilating most uh, stretches. Uh, Grasping forceps uh, can also be used as an alternative in treating sutures. Uh, the average time needed for silo endoscopy uh, is approximately 60 minutes. 57 minutes plus or minus 40 minutes for international silo endoscopy for single silo lift. And uh, for multiple silo lift, uh, we, it, uh, it may um, cause 90 minutes uh, plus or minus 42 minutes. Then this is a, a scoring for a stenosis uh, by cyanoendoscopy. S0 for rare, S0 when used and stenosis is evident. S1 when introductal uh, diaphragmatic stenosis, which is unique or which is either unique or multiple. S2 is given for unique ductal stenosis in the main duct. And ST is given when multiple uh, or diffuse ductal stenosis is evident in main duct. And S4, uh, when stenosis uh, is generalized in, uh, in each and every duct. Then mucus flex, which is nothing but incompletely mineralized cyanolid. Um, the normal cyanolid or calcified. Without mineralization progress, uh, the cyanolid are called as mucus flex. Which is which also causes introductal obstruction due to non mineralized introductal object. Uh, what is the diagnostic aid used here is also sandwiches. Then foreign bodies. What are the foreign uh, bodies which cause obstruction in the uh, salivary gland? Is toothpaste. It may do. It may uh, toothpaste bristles, toothpicks, spikes of meat, fish bone, or portions of finger nail. 
and what comedy lost in the uh, what in such and this common in this tension for in the then parotid fistula um parotid uh, fistula it may be internal when it opens inside the mouth it it, it is said to be internal uh, when it opens to the exterior it said to be external uh, let's see what is the etiology uh, it occurs due to traumatic due to pen penetrative injury in the hand uh, it may also due to occur due to parotid abscess in advent incision uh, in uh, the condition of parotid parotidectomy and it may also arise uh, due to complication of superficial parotidectomy and the main clinical feature uh, it, it has open in the cheeks xylograms in xylograms uh, the fistula is in relation to the main duct or uh, it, it is used uh, whether the fistula is in the gland or duct diagnosis how can uh, we diagnose uh, diagnose the uh, fistula um, because uh, uh, because of the uh, infection that will uh, be discharged from the dental duct after which is also occurred uh, due to trauma or uh, superficial parotidectomy how do we manage it? the only surgical uh, only by surgical approach uh, which is uh, the reconstruction of the duct then a uh, cyst of uh, salivary gland let's see mucosy which is nothing but uh, the swelling caused by uh, pooling of saliva at the site of injured minor salivary gland which is also pseudo cyst like the statin cyst uh, we saw in the initial slide uh, because it also have a uh, no exterior line it arises due to laceration of minor salivary gland which occur due to trauma which also result in extra vasations of mucus into the connective tissue therefore it sometimes the mucus is called as extra mucus extra vasation system it occur in younger patients and it have no uh, sex predilection this is a here we can appreciate mucus in the inner aspect of the lower lip which is a most common site also then what are the types of mucus first one is extravasation type and it also has revulsion type extravasation extravasation type is usually found on lower labial mucosa buccal mucosa retromolar area and they are not in the exterior and in the means this extra vasation it gives a secondary inflammatory reaction and we can also appreciate a periodic a discharge of viscous fluid from the lesion and on coming to a retention type uh, this is less common than extra vasation which usually affects uh, older individuals and see frequently on the upper lip hot palate and floor of the mouth and maxillary sinus then how do we manage it by the surgical of the cyst you have to remove the cyst along with the gland involved usually with the use of scalpel blade uh, is perhaps the most commonly used method for the treatment of mucus and then the incision is tied together with intermittent suture and minimize the risk of uh, if we put intermittent suture it will minimize the risk of recurrence of mucus system another less invasive technique is to excise the mucus and the adjoining salivary gland with the use of laser so laser uh, did a very good job in the treatment of mucus cryotherapy is also the emerging treatment procedure for mucus is which is uh, which essentially involves the freezing of affected oral tissue to get rid of the uh, system then vascularization is a, a technique used in the treatment of uh, also used in, uh, to in the treatment of mucus especially the ones caused by blockage of salivary gland this uh, procedure aids uh, the formation of new glandular tracts and allowing the saliva secretion uh, accumulated saliva secretion to flow out of the glands and uh, cause a uh, reopening of the salivary gland so vascularization is also one of the emerging treatment protocol for the uh, uh, treating mucus then another one uh, important therapy we use now we use today is uh, uh, intranasal 
Kartika student from Ekmodetis. At this question of inclination of Kartika student conception, uh, like uh, whether uh, like in the uh, voice and condition, uh, we used to uh, inject the traditional Kartika student injection to the lesion to bring down the inflammation and it also accelerates the healing. A good alternative non surgical procedure which can be performed in short span of time and which is also economical and aesthetically more beneficial than surgery. Uh, Prayotherapy or laser ablation or any procedure we perform. So it is a good alternative to uh, all the uh, surgical procedures, which is very simple, repeatable, cost effective, and potentially curative method and also easily acceptable by the patient also. Uh, a granula. Granula is nothing but when mucosal is found on the floor of the mouth, we simply call the, uh, the thing is a granula, which is mucus extravasation cyst involving a sublingual gland and the type of mucosal found on the floor of the mouth and which have the one main thing is brilliant translucent swelling because it 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 uh, it is positive on both transillumination and fluctuant. So it is called a drill translucent swelling. For a granula, which is usually a painless swelling located in the floor of the mouth, uh, clinical features it usually interfere with speech, swallowing, mastication, and respiration as it displaces the tongue in an upward and medial direction. Sometimes the tongue uh, may put pressure on the lesion which interfere with the salivary outflow, thus leading to obstructive uh, uh, salivary gland obstruction and uh, symptoms arise uh, or pain when eating or chewing. It is painful swelling, the swelling is painless, but uh, uh, when interfering with the salivary flow, uh, it, it, it creates pain while eating or chewing. Then cervical granula, which is asymptomatic mass in the neck. Here, we can, we can appreciate a big uh, granula in the floor of the mouth, beneath the tongue, uh, which is usually lateral to the midline, either to the uh, either uh, left or right, but it is usually located lateral to the midline in the floor of the mouth. The classification, as usual, we say, uh, either uh, oral uh, ranulose or plunging or mixer lesions, plunging ranulose. What are the complications of mucosal and ranulose infection, rupture, and deformation? Recurrence is uh, uh, a very, uh, very big complications in mucosal and ranulose. Dysphagia, in case of large uh, ranula, uh, we can't be able to swallow and it also interferes in speech also. Uh, what are the possible surgical complications? Intraoperatively uh, hemorrhage, water and duct damage, uh, which leads to stenosis and uh, obstructive sialoidy mucus, uh, an injury to the lingual nerve, which cause temporary or permanent paresthesia may also uh, happen. Uh, facial nerve, nodular mandibular branch damage, which also leads to paresthesia. And postoperatively, uh, the complications uh, over a hematoma, infection, deficiency of the wound. Uh, then, about how is the plunging or cervical granula arise as a result of the failure to excise oral granulos? When we fail to excise oral granulos completely, uh, then the oral granula leads to develop uh, plunging or cervical granula. So, we, we, we are uh, trying to create the uh, oral granulas uh, by excising the uh, granula not completely. Plunging granulas may enlarge and result in a respiratory compromise or acute media stenosis, which is a very life threatening complication of uh, cervical cancer. So, then, surgical management. Surgical management is uh, of granulas uh, coincide with the treatment of uh, mucosal. Yeah, so it also the treatment protocol uh, are similar um, to the mucosal process, mucosal. Like it includes a uh, mouseplexation, excision, and removal of uh, sublingual cancer. Then comes to mucus retention system. 
which also leads to obstruction of minor salivary really gland, which leads to lack of pop saliva. Then continuous pressure in the gland due to obstruction, which leads to dilates the duct and forms a cyst-like tissue. So this is the reason for the cyst. So then we see the vehicle features, which is more common in older patients with no sex prediction, which is more common in parotidal, lower of the moon, buccal mucosa, and root cell. Uh, this swelling is usually soft, ductured, and bluish in color. And how to manage by simple conservative surgical excision? Uh, then, in case of multiple retention system, uh, we usually prescribe antibiotics like erythromycin, chlorpyrifen, mucus to remove uh, the pain temporarily. temporarily. The use of uh, silos uh, like lithium and uh, chlorpyrifen. Uh, stimulates the salivary flow, uh, which also uh, prevents the accumulation of problems. Then, asymptomatic enlargement of salivary that is uh, also called a siladenosis, which is non neoplastic and non inflammatory And it associated with cirrhosis, um, ovarian thyroid insufficiency, alcoholism, general malnutrition, Anorexia nervosa, which is a stimulated uh, vomiting and malnutrition. It also associated with neurogenic conditions like antihypertensive drugs and psychotropic drugs and sympathomimetic drugs. Dysregulation of the autonomic nervous uh, innovations of the salivary artery also lead to aberrant intracellular security cycle, then uh, leads to silosis condition. Uh, let's see what are the clinical features, which is more common in uh, females with no age prediction. Uh, it can occur in any, any age group of people. And it is usually bilateral and recurrent painless enlargement of the gland may uh, occur. Then, uh, viral infection of uh, salivary gland. The first is cytomegalic virus inclusion disease. The uh, very uh, notable uh, feature in this uh, disease is uh, uh, owl like appearance. Owl like appearance is a characteristic feature of cytomegalo virus. So, by the name itself, we came to know uh, this disease is caused by a uh, cytomegalo virus. It has many pain, um, uh, cuts. Which affects, uh, which creates CNS abnormalities like microcephaly, mental retardation, acidity, uh, epilepsy, and periventricular transplantation. In eye, it causes a uh, choroid, uh, retinitis and haptic atrophy. In ear, sensorineural deafness. In liver, it creates hepatitis splenomegaly and jaundice, which is uh, due to hepatitis. Lungs cause it will cause pneumonitis. In heart, myocarditis, uh, thrombocytic purpura, and hemolytic anemia may also uh, also occur with this disease. Late sequelae in the individuals are asymptomatic at birth, but hearing defects and reduced intelligence may develop later. Let's see, mumps. Mumps is caused by paramyxovirus, which is very acute contentious viral infection. It may affect unilateral or bilateral and, uh, and cause swelling of the salivary gland cell. Uh, may commonly involve uh, the parotid gland, which is major salivary gland, and it also occur in testis, meninges, pancreas, and heart. Transmitted through saliva and urine, and it has an incubation period of two to three weeks, and it also has a prodrom prodromal symptoms like uh, onset of headache. Chills, fever, vomiting, and pain. Swelling of parotid gland leads to elevation of ear lobal. So, if we note elevation of ear lobal, uh, we are uh, we can identify the mumps. Okay. So, swelling of sublingual gland causes swelling in floor of the mouth. Then we see what are the complications uh, may arise due to mumps. Arthritis, meningitis, deafness may also occur. Most mastoiditis and meningocephalitis, encephalitis, epidermitis, and myocarditis. Uh, biochemically, uh, we 
uh, appreciate uh, increased levels of salivary amylase level. And in parents of virus, uh, may be isolated from saliva uh, uh, before six days and up to 99 days uh, after the uh, after uh, we appreciate the salivary gland uh, swelling. Then, how do we prevent mumps? Mumps vaccine is one of the way to um, eradicate this uh, virus, mumps. So, what's inside, what contains mumps vaccine? Mumps vaccine is derived from general name sperm, mumps virus. This vaccine induces antibody in 96% of serum negative recipients and has 97% of protective efficacy. So, uh, we prevent, uh, we almost eradicate other mumps now by, by, by vaccine. So, the initial mumps immunization usually as measles uh, contains, which is called as MMR vaccine, for it includes, it's a combination vaccine which contains uh, measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, which, uh, which is usually recommended at 12 to 15 months of age. The second immunization of uh, MMR is recommended at 4 to 6 years of age. Then, then I'm coming to bacterial infection, uh, it's called sial adenitis, sial adenitis, uh, which is either acute sial adenitis and or chronic sial adenitis which is nothing but sudden inflammation of the salivary glands, which usually affects one gland and a common in the age group of 50 and 60s. And it can occur at, uh, it may occur at any uh, age group of age group people. It caused by bacteria uh, called Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus viridens, and Haemophilus influenza. It also affect a uh, parotid gland, sublingual, and submandibular gland. Obstructive sialidin. Chronic infective sialidinitis leads to chronic adult sialidinitis and chronic juvenile recurrent parotitis. Obstructive sialadenitis uh, leads to stone or strictures in the gland. Acute infective sialadenitis uh, leads to acute bacterial superative sialadenitis. And then, and then coming to autoimmune disorders, uh, Jogren syndrome. If Jogren syndrome, if it's primary, it is called Sika syndrome. It is uh, usually associated with anti SSA uh, uh, and anti SSBLA antibodies. Alternatively, it can be secondary also. Uh, first of all, Jogren syndrome uh, has a, a primary and secondary uh, condition. In secondary condition, means to uh, it is uh, usually accompanied by other autoimmune diseases like lupus erythematosus rheumatoid arthritis and a scleroderma. Scleroder Jogren syndrome, how can we appreciate Jogren syndrome? What are the uh, clinical features of Jogren syndrome? Uh, it causes dryness of various body surfaces and lacrimal, uh, lacrimal gland involvement uh, also there and it leads to dryness of the eyes, blurry vision, itchy, redness and burning then ultimately lead to skeletal conjunctivitis, which is the inflammation and ulceration of the cornea and conjunctiva. And then also leads to um, xerostomia and or dry mouth, uh, which leads to difficulty in tasting and swallowing, and cracks and fissures in the mouth, and eventually a dental caries. Because it's dental caries. Uh, uh, finally, uh, the swelling inside the salivary gland and lacrimal gland compresses the nearby stretches, uh, nearby stretches like nerves, and also cause uncomfortable pain. In addition to that, the uh, so Jogren syndrome can also affect the exocrine uh, glands, and sometimes it can overlap into another autoimmune disorder. So, 
it's very uh, very 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 complicated chagrin syndrome is very very complicated systemic symptoms include fever a fatigue myalgia and unbe unintentional weight loss and infidelity there can be vascular conditions like palpable purpura due to bleeding within the skin so um, tiny red red spots in the skin which is a uh, bleeding within the skin that is called palpable purpura these purpura uh, can develop into uh, may be may develop into large ulcers that can get infected this small tiny tiny bleeding so within the skin may also turn uh, out into big ulceration uh, in the skin then another vascular condition is renault's phenomena which is uh, where the arterial passes reduce the blood flow to the fingers for few minutes at a time this is called renault's phenomena uh, renault's phenomena causes arterial passes in the fingers by uh, by reducing the blood flow the fingers turn white and then blue often with numbness or pain and when this blood flow returns the finger turn uh, to the normal uh, color and texture and no matter what are the hematological manifestation of uh, jogren syndrome which include mild anemia lipidemia and hyper uh, gamma globulinemia monoclonal uh, gamma bodies and cryoglobulinemia and lymphoma finally uh, some individuals with jogren syndrome may also develop autoimmune thyroiditis starting from the eyes there are three commonly used tests for a dry eyes how to identify uh brainness uh, by a uh, three test first is screener test which uh, measures reflex tear production uh then uh, then um we saw briefly about that uh, test a folded test strip of sterile tissue paper supplied in a standard kit it also comes in a standard kit is placed over the margin of each lower eyelid at junction of middle and lateral nerves the extent of wetting is measured over 5 minutes wetting of less than 5 mm suggests acquired tear deficiency and another test is ocular surface staining that's what dyes like rose bengal it's also called as rose bengal test fluorescent or glycerin green or used to stain areas of damaged tissue uh, uh, by this uh, staining we can identify the uh, damaged areas of the tissue Acne surface is then examined because see lamp to assess the damage to the conjunctiva and trachea, and then comes to nose and nares. It causes ulceration and bleeding, and it also affects the larynx, which leads to difficulty in speaking. Also, in some people, uh, dryness also uh, be evident in the skin and vagina. Instead of eyes, we also know dryness in the uh, skin and vagina. What are the gastrointestinal problems associated with jogging syndrome? Or the stage here, there is difficulty in swallowing uh, due to dryness and esophageal motility disorders, uh, dyspepsia, gastritis, and celiac disease. Liver abnormalities like primary biliary cirrhosis or autoimmune hepatitis and pancreatic diseases like autoimmune cirrhosis and pancreatic disease. What are the lung problems associated with Jordan syndrome? Includes chronic cough as well as interstitial lung disease. Uh, it also uh, involves uh, renal, which uh, causes uh, intestinal nef nephritis, and the, it causes defects in tubular function, causing creatinine levels to rise. More than it can cause glomerular nephritis, which leads to hematuria and proteinuria. These are my references. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you.